How's everyone doing this evening? Woo, yeah. Cool. <clears throat> so we do have the uh, notes on the version outline um, on your little app thing. So you guys want to pull that up. I encourage you, um, if you have that, pull that up. Or if you have a notepad, get that ready. Because um, tonight's going to be, I think, very pertinent um, for all of us in some way or another. Um, if you guys have your Bibles, if you would turn to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 6. Starting in verse 12, I'm going to read the text, and then we will open up in a word of prayer. <clears throat> all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Let's pray. Lord, I ask today as we uh, look through your text um, in this specific passage, Lord, concerning sexual morality, that we would take it seriously, that we would think through it. Help us to reflect, Lord, and be changed by your words. Lord, whatever I speak, I ask that um, it would be according to your word. Give me the words to say, the clarity of thought, Lord, to be able to speak this passage. And I pray this in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. So, yes, the topic today is about sex. So, I'm sure I have your attention now. But, um, it might be an overstatement to say that our society is obsessed with sex. Is that, is that too much of a dangerous statement there? I mean, if you look at magazines, books, music, and news, it's all saturated with it. Movies nowadays have gone worse and worse. Radar movies use pornographic footage. I mean, you think about the old movies like Stanley Kubrick films or even the Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, it's just right there. Or pornography has increased so exponentially in the church and in society. There's a word for this, and it's called casual sex, this idea that it's just something that is normal. We take it. It's, it's a part of our society, right? We see it everywhere. Posters, advertisements. If you go in especially the major cities, they're not afraid to show full nudity now on magazines or on posters outside on a building. I think it's safe to say that it's become very casual. And I'm going to say also that it's become very casual in the church. Um, I, in every church I've been to, there's been at least four to five people I know that have struggled with sexual immorality. And I'm talking severe sexual immorality. Families destroyed, um, people not able to function as human beings because they're so addicted to pornography in one way or another. And so that is what we're going to be talking about today, is the term casual sex. There is um, another culture that was obsessed with sex and was very casual about it, and that was the Corinthian church. And um, so far we've seen how Paul has been hammering issue after issue in the Corinthian church by bringing the doctrine of Christ and the gospel to the doorsteps of our hearts and our actions. So we've learned about it in Romans. He's talked about it in the beginning of 1 Corinthians, and now he's going and he's practically applying it to every part of our lives. Um, last week, Ben Harris uh, preached on you know, lawsuits and divisions using the court against our brothers. And now, this week, we're talking about sexuality and how we're going to let the gospel shape and affect how we view it. Um, you guys know, like, our all-famous catchphrases for, like, excuses, you know? Have you ever heard of those? Like, the most classic one that is overused all the time is, like, you know, if you're late for your homework, you know, you said, my dog, you know, ate my homework. Or, you know, if you do something bad and you have to come up with excuses, you're like, well, everyone does it. Or the real popular one is like, I'm only human, right? So we have all these famous catchphrases. I'm sure you guys have all your famous excuse lines, you know, for if something's late, something's not due. If your mom, you know, when you're growing up said, hey, do you take the trash out or let the dog out? That still happens with me. It's okay. But, you know, I'll come up with an excuse like, well, you know, I just, you know, I'll have to come up with some excuse. I don't know what the phrase is, but I think of something really clever usually. But the Corinthians had a famous catchphrase, an excuse they used. And the pagan Christians would always say, when it came to sex, casual sex, they said, in verse 13, if you look in uh, chapter 6, it says, 
Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And I don't know about you, but when you start reading the passage through 12 to 13, you're like, where does food come in? Like, what is Paul talking about? Like, what does food and sex have to do with anything? And it's like, okay, what are you talking about here, Paul? But the pagan Corinthians had this famous catchphrase to excuse the sexual immorality they engaged in. To them, it was as natural as eating or drinking. There's nothing special about it. In fact, performing a sexual act or choosing which sexual act to perform was the difference between choosing fries and a hamburger and a fettuccine Alfredo pasta. That was their mentality of it. And usually in the banquet halls and the rich people, they would have food. They would, you know, gluttony and sex was very common back then in the day, and so they would provide food and they would provide sex. That was their thing. That was the name of their game. And so this catchphrase was to denote this casualness. That's how casual it was to them. And I think it's the same as it is today now. People, you never heard that phrase, you know, it's just like a handshake nowadays, right? I mean, how many romantic comedy movies have you seen where there's at least a one-night stand or a sexual encounter in the movie? I mean, I, I don't know if I can name any. There might be one or two, and if they do, they probably don't have the greatest reviews or ratings, right? Because they don't have that stuff in it. The fact of the matter is, it was rampant back in that day, and Paul sees how bad it is. And he's like, guys, the gospel should change our view on sexuality. And one of the reasons why there's this casualness and how they kind of adopted it as just a bodily function or just something you perform was a belief called dualism. Um, if you know Plato, has anyone heard of Plato? Okay, so he perpetrated this belief that the body and soul were separate, and in fact that the soul was actually imprisoned in the body. So the body wasn't very important. It was once you reached eternity, you wouldn't have a body anymore, right? Well, I think you guys are catching on that that's not very biblical. And so they kind of adopt this idea, well, the body doesn't matter in this life. It doesn't affect me spiritually because, you know, my mind is separate from my body completely, so I can do whatever I want. So some would revert to asceticism, just like punishing their bodies, you know, like the Stoics would do, or um, hedonism is what the case that was going on in this church. Just life's an amusement park. You know, stuff your face full of cotton candy. Everything's going to be okay. Ride as many rides as you want. Get sick. And when you die, it doesn't matter. Your body doesn't matter. It doesn't affect you. And so that was the kind of the layout. And Paul comes, and he brings the gospel, and he's going to correct several, search in, or several beliefs in the Corinthian church. And most interesting is actually very applicable to our day and age. And so there's three lies, three lies that the Corinthian church had adopted. And we're going to talk about those, and we're going to bring the truth, the light of the gospel, as Paul does in this passage, to those three lies concerning human sexuality. Number one. Sexual immorality, this is very important, is not natural. That's the truth. Sexual immorality is not natural or normal. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 14 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. We think it's just natural, right? It's like, oh, you know, it's just what I do. Um, I always hear the famous excuse, um, specifically when men sometimes will come to me and be like, oh, you know, it's just natural. Like, I'm visual. You know, I just like looking at the opposite sex in a way I shouldn't. It's just who I am. Maybe that's the excuse that sometimes we bring up. But that's what they were kind of saying. Well, you know, the food is for the stomach and the stomach for the food, so naturally I'm going to eat. So when I lust, I'm just going to indulge. It should be okay because I'm just an animal, I guess. And that's what they were believing. And that's why this lie is so dangerous. It's kind of like the Elvis Presley song about, oh, you're nothing but a hound dog, right? I mean, that was the whole point of the song was about play the field, you know. Oh, you're, you're a guy, you're a woman, and you like that. You just do it. That's just who you are. And that's been pretty perpetrated by the idea that we're just animals, that we don't have real significant value. But sexual morality is not natural. And there was two lies that the Corinthian church, and I think we as well, adopt today. The first one is that we think that sex is just like eating or doing any other physical action. There's no purpose or meaning behind it other than that. The second is that they and we adopt an unhealthy belief that freedom is the ability to choose right or wrong. That's what they believed, and that I think what we believe as well. So kind of attacking that first lie with bringing the light of the gospel, Paul says that the body was made for the Lord, 
meaning our bodies are physical representations. We are the body of Christ, right? Which you'll talk on later on in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians. But our bodies matter. What we do with our bodies are important because they're the physical extension of what happens in our spiritual lives, right? What happens in our heart will affect what we do physically. So to say that whatever happens in the physical world doesn't matter is very naive. It's not true, right? And so that's one of the two he was attacking. He also says that our bodies are important. He was addressing, he said, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power, meaning when the new heavens and earth are created, we'll be living in physical bodies, the resurrection of the dead, right? As a Christian, that's what's supposed to happen. We will be resurrected. So he's like, for you to say that your bodies don't matter or that it's just natural, like it's a natural inclination, is a misunderstanding of what true sexuality is. And the second one that he addresses is the fact that freedom is the ability to do right or wrong. Most of the time when I ask people, I'm like, so how would you define freedom, like true freedom? People would say, well, I can do right or I can do wrong. And that's what the Corinthians thought. They said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful, as Paul says. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. If you remember, uh, Paul had talked in the book of Galatians or so about the doctrine of grace and how we've been freed from the law and that we no longer have to fulfill the law, but because of God's grace, we shall now naturally fulfill or follow the law. Does that make sense? So what Paul is trying to get here is that you're abusing grace. You're saying that now that you're free from the law, you can do whatever you want. It says in Galatians 5, 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. It's interesting is that he says, he kind of paints a different picture. Instead, he says freedom is the ability to do what is right. That's why he freed us. That's why God's grace has impacted us. He says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And I think we need to realize that when it comes to sexuality, we, when you adopt the idea that, oh, it's about freedom's about me doing what I want to do, right or wrong, we open up the door to committing that. So application, let's just hit it right home with this first point. We have to combat the culture's idea of sex. Okay? We have to combat it. The first one is very simple. Stop saying lust is something natural or normal for guys or for women. It's not natural. It's wrong. Is slavery natural? If you're enslaved to sin, is that natural? Is an addiction natural? It's not. It's not natural. I hear a lot of people try to explain it, you know, especially like I've heard men say, well, it's just who, what we do. You know, I'm, I'm going to look at a woman and what I look like. And women say the same things too. One time I was, um, I used to live in the south of France, and so we'd go on the beach um, at the right hours because in France, there is topless nudity, okay? And so... I didn't want to just go on the beach any time of the day. And so we'd go sometimes in the evening when it get colder and uh, nobody would be topless. But um, there was a guy, my dad's coworker, who was there. And he was not a Christian. Um, and he was kind of pretty okay with me and the fact that he was addicted to pornography. Um, he wondered, he asked my mom, he's like, why doesn't Nick want to look at that? He's like, that's unnatural. <laughs> he's like, that's weird. He's a man, isn't he? He, he, he even thought it was so unnatural, he wondered if I was even attracted to girls. Being honest, that's how severe our culture thinks it's natural. I mean, look at the movies. I mean, James Bond, there can't be one movie that he doesn't get at least three conquests in, right? Or that women are just objects, right? Women, you're supposed to just show yourselves. That's what your, your purpose in life is. If you don't, then you're not going to make money in the business, right? Or you're not going to be important. The guy won't trust you. The guy won't love you. That's the lies that are being perpetrated. And, and I'm not trying to be you know, crude here, but that is the truth. That is what is going on in our culture. And I think it's important that we hit it and address it head on, that it's not normal. It is not normal. Slavery is not normal. Romans 6.18 says, And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Once again, it's rather you're a slave to righteousness or a slave to sin. Freedom is the ability to do what is right. Only what is right. That's what we, the freedom we want to get to, to where what we're only doing is God's will. And so I think two of the reasons why we find ourselves in sexual morality, or maybe you are finding yourself in there, is because you thought it's just what men or women are supposed to do. And second, that it's normal. It's normal, and it's, it, freedom is for me to choose right or wrong. 
and you've denied the fact that it is bondage. And so application number two, realize the bondage and slavery sexual sin is. Correct your definition of freedom. I'm not telling you that maybe freedom means it's the choice to do right or wrong. No, I'm saying it's, that's wrong. That's not the truth. Biblically, it's the ability to do is right. And that's why Christ has set us free. For freedom, he says. Paul says, for freedom, we've set, Christ has set you free. So don't, don't, don't sin then. Don't even think about doing what's wrong. Number two, sexual immorality is a spiritual issue. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Sometimes I think we need to realize it's not just a physical act. Okay, so the first one that we talked about is it's not natural, meaning just because it's a physical act doesn't mean you just do it. And that part of that is realizing it's not just a physical act. It's not just like eating. It's not just like drinking. There are more pervasive consequences to how you see and do your sexuality. Sexual sin is a spiritual issue because it's a sin that we use against our own body. Like Paul says, you're using it against you. It's an ingestion of sin. Remember, our bodies are physical representations of Christ, and so how we act reflects what's inside. Okay, so someone who's performing sexual morality of any kind, okay, is reflecting what's going on in their heart. It's an idol issue, meaning they don't value God as they ought to value. And I think sometimes one of the biggest things is we think of it as just in terms of like a physical act, and we don't remember that there are spiritual issues wrong with it. Um, if someone's addicted to pornography, there's a reason behind that. The problem, that's a symptom of a deeper problem of idolatry. Why do I turn to sexual morality? Why do I look at pornography? Why do I have sex outside of marriage? Why do I commit adultery? And those are the manifestations, the physical manifestations of something that's going on inside of you. Plus, Paul also says, he says, we are also a temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Once again, denoting that how you treat your body is very important because the Holy Spirit is living within you. And the Holy Spirit should be changing you. It should be changing your heart and then influencing and changing your actions because we are the body of Christ. We are representing the body of Christ spiritually. What's the application for that? First one, the very important one. Ask yourself why you're running to sexual immorality. Why is it an idol? So, some of you, I'm sure, are struggling with some form of sexual morality. Maybe you're pushing the boundaries with your girlfriend or boyfriend. Uh, maybe you're addicted to pornography. Maybe it's homosexuality. I don't know what it can possibly be. But sometimes, when you hear this, I want you guys to be very careful, because I'm not saying here, I want you guys to really under understand the deep problems that, that need to be addressed, because I want you to hear this and be like, okay, now I gotta go put software on my computer, I need to stop YouTube surfing, I need to stop doing this, 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 and this. Those are important. Those are vital. Those are things that you should set up for yourself, for success. But now I want you to ask you, I want you to ask the deeper question, what is the root problem? Why do I run after this? And I have an illustration that might help a little bit. So let's say there's a guy who struggles with, struggles with gambling, okay, and he lives in Las Vegas or Reno, uh, they're one of the two, and he just struggles with it all the time. You know, he's deep in with the sharks. You know, when he sees a slot machine or, you know, that blackjack getting played around the table, he's just like, I got to get in. I have to gamble. And his friends are like, how are we going to solve this issue? They're like, okay, I know what we can do. Well, let's take him out of Las Vegas and Reno. Let's go put him in Canada in some shack and give him some time, and maybe, you know, he won't gamble anymore. Well, he goes out there. He stops gambling. The question is, has the problem been solved? I would say no, because once he's around that all again, he now wants to do it. He desires it. The problem is that he desires it. True victory over sin is when he finds himself in Las Vegas and Reno and doesn't want to gamble. He doesn't want that life anymore. So is it important that he should get some time away? Yes, but the goal is to get to the point where he doesn't desire it anymore. And so for you guys, I encourage you, put those boundaries, put those um, circumstances, set yourself up for success, but then deal with the root issue. Why do you run after it? Um, 
and kind of getting practical here with some of the lies I think we adopt. Men, maybe you um, pursue sexual immorality because it makes you feel like a man. It makes you feel like you maybe have control. Women, maybe you run after another man or something because you feel special. Maybe you give yourself away because you feel like maybe he'll love you back. What are the deep problems going on there? Because it's more than just the physical act, right? There's something else that we have to address. We have to see what's really going on. As Paul says, you know, it's, you're sinning against your own body. There's a spiritual issue there. There are pervasive effects. Like with pornography, it's not just a physical act. It affects and rewires how you think of the opposite sex when you do it. It changes. You see people less as a person and just as a physical object, right? Because if it's just physical, then the other person is just a physical person. And they have no value because spiritually, you're not thinking of it that way. That's dangerous. That is very dangerous. The second application, and one I think is very important, is you know when you remove sin in your life, there has to be something there that if your idol is sexual sin, then what do you need to turn your eyes to? And that is to God. Remember, number two, remember the joy in following God. Um, sometimes we look at uh, this, for the small group this last Monday, uh, we were going over Psalms uh, 119, and David kept talking about how he delighted and meditated on God's law and just, like, loved it. Like, he talks, I praise it, I meditate, I delight in it. And, it, you know, when I first read that book, I was kind of like, who delights in reading a rule book, you know, like... It just does not make any sense. Like, I do not sit down in my syllabus. I'm like, oh, joyful syllabus. Like, you know, <laughs> it's so amazing, you know. And I began to recognize something. David wasn't delighting in what he was going to do with the law. He was delighting in how the law revealed God's character. So we went through the Ten Commandments, and we asked ourselves, what does this tell us about God's law? Let's not, go, let's not skip to the practical application. Let's ask ourselves, what is it? reflecting. And we read through the, the biggest one, which applies tonight, is you shall not commit adultery, Exodus 20, 14. And I, it took a while for them to understand. They're like, uh, it means that we should be faithful. I'm like, yes, but what, is it, what does that tell us about God? And then they were like, tells us he's faithful. It's like, exactly. He tells us not to commit adultery because he's faithful. Don't you like it when someone's faithful to you and committed to you and loves you for who you are? and you can trust them, sexual morality is the complete opposite of that. It is against that. That's why God hates it. He hates stealing because he believes in justice. He hates using his name in vain because he is the greatest being there ever is, and we should respect that. And I just thought about that more and more. He's against, he's against lying because he wants the truth. We like the truth, right? We love the truth. I mean, you want your grade to come back right. You don't want someone to falsify like, your grade in a class, right? You want truth. Truth is important. To God, that's important. So reflect on that. You have to have the motivation to get out of your sin. And that motivation comes from reflecting on God himself, his faithfulness to you. Because if God's faithful to me, I want to be faithful to him. Because Christ died for me. Number three, and this is the last point, sexual immorality is first and foremost against God. 1 Corinthians six fifteen through 17, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Do you guys think that God has anything to do with sex? <laughs> or even, do you guys even know why he created sex? Like, like philosophically asking you, like, do you guys have an idea? That's rhetorical. I'm going to ask you to, like, you know, shout out. But, like, I'm just wanting to get it out. Like, have you guys really thought about what the purpose of it is? Right? Because if it's not just a physical act and it's a spiritual act, then what is it representing spiritually? What does that even mean? That's the big question, is what is the meaning of sex? Sex is an intimate act that unifies a man and a woman together in a committed and faithful relationship. They become one. It's a sense of unity, a unity that can provide 
the safe context for trust, faithfulness, and commitment. And I was trying to think of a good illustration. Like, I really didn't know which one, but the more I thought about it, and I'm sure you guys can think of it, but marriage? Maybe? Yeah? I don't know. Maybe I'm too crazy. (laughs) But this is why God created marriage. Let's go ahead and read Ephesians 5, 25 through 32. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Just as Paul was talking about in the letter. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This union represents commitment. It represents faithfulness. What if I said that marriage is a representation or a parable or a drama to display God's faithfulness to the church? It is a living parable. It's a drama on stage. It's literally, okay, guy, you're going to be the, uh, you're going to be Christ, and then woman, you're going to be, represent the church, and you guys are going to come together. We're going to show how much God loves us and cares for us and a lifelong commitment that God has for us because he is a faithful God. And you two will be joined together till death do you part, and that is the way it ought to be. And the reason why divorce, the reason why adultery is so heinous, is because when you commit that in a relationship or in marriage, you are saying that God is not faithful. Because if it's a representation, we represent Christ in what we do with our bodies or in marriage. We're saying something about God. So when the, the guy, let's say, for instance, divorces or commits adultery to his wife, that's kind of like saying, oh, in the, I mean, in the play, if it's representing Christ in the church, that's saying, oh, Christ just split off and did his own thing. He did, he's not faithful to you anymore. That is why God hates it so much. Because it's a profaning of his name. It's a profaning of his love. It's, marriage is supposed to represent the gospel. It is the most vivid representation of the gospel here on this earth. And the church and our society is trashing it and making a mockery of it. It's cheap. But what does Paul say? He says, for you were bought with a price. It's not cheap. Christ dying on the cross for you was not cheap. It wasn't cheap whatsoever. So why are you treating sexuality, something that's supposed to mean faithfulness, commitment, as cheap? Are you saying that my love is cheap? That's why casual sex is such an affrontation to God. Sexual immorality from a Christian tells the world that God doesn't care about faithfulness or commitment. Why do you think so many families have been destroyed? Or why do you think sexual immorality is so rampant? Maybe why do you struggle with it? I can't tell you how much doubt that has been put in my mind about my faith because I saw marriages torn apart by sexual immorality. I was like, what's the point of it then? People don't fight for marriage anymore. They're not committed in their singleness to God because they think it's worthless. But that's my question to you today, is for application, there's two things we can do. For one, be committed to sexual purity. The second is be committed to faithfulness. Whether you're single, whether you're married, if you're married, be committed to your spouse, be committed to her, be committed to him, Have that love for one another. Be committed to faithfulness. Realize that sexuality, what you do with your body, has a spiritual effect, a lasting effect. Not just on you, but on what everyone else says, or what everyone else does. It's, I don't know how else to put it, but it's just a shame to see people I've known in the church, people who were leaders to me, men or women, who I looked up to commit adultery or sexual immorality. And it just destroyed everything. So what are you guys going to do with your life here and now? For one, if it is a struggle, realize that God is faithful to you. Okay? Meaning turn away from your sin. Repent. Turn away from it. Don't be a part of it. Ask yourself, why? Why do I... If, if I love that God is faithful and committed to me, 
why do I keep on doing it? Treat others as you would want to be treated. Because God gave his life for you. And also realize that it's just, guys, sex outside of marriage is just not good. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be great. It's just not. All of you guys, you you have to realize that. Look into the Bible and trust that what God says about it is true. But, you know, there's nothing more. I had my, you know, during that period when there was a lot of people committing infidelity or just a lot of broken hearts, I had a friend who got married, and they were faithful to each other. And it was just, I can't tell you how much that affected me. I was like, wow, you know, there is still, like, hope, you know. So how are you going to fight for sexual purity? How are you going to fight for the truth, rather in your singleness or in your marriage? Whether you're married or single, the fight is still yours, and it still matters what you do. The last major application, talk to somebody if you're struggling with it. Unless you go and you confront, confess it, and try to get help. One of the biggest things when people come to me and they're like, I'm struggling with this, Nick, I'm always like, just, I start clapping, I don't know. But I'm just like, this is great because you've humbled yourself to the point where you recognize the problem and are desiring grace. If you don't take that first step, I'm sorry, you can't fulfill any of this. You can't. Because you won't humble yourself enough to realize the need for it. But his grace is there for you. He wants you to live the fullest life, and he wants you to represent his faithfulness, commitment, rather in your singleness to God and God only, or in marriage to your spouse and to God. I beg you, please, take this seriously. Don't just shove this under the carpet and say, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Talk to one of the officers, talk to one of the staff. We want to help you. We want to see you grow where you're at. And we don't want you, like, you know, Andy always to say, we don't want you to just maintain your faith, but continue to grow. Let's pray. Lord, I know this is uh, one of the more difficult subjects and also something that I believe a lot of us are struggling with, Lord, day in and day out. We need your grace. We need your commitment and faithfulness. Help us to see it. Help us to realize it. Help us to turn to you, to repent, Lord, if we have sinned. Lord, to continue.